of people in the room. So the question is that, do you prefer to see the big picture or are you a detailed person? No right or wrong answers. I just need to see the mindset in the room. What about eight responses so far? We will stop at some point because I. Assume that not everybody will be able to answer. So that's nice. So we got about 14, 15. The house is tilted towards big picture and some detail. Okay, now this uh, getting closer. The house is divided now, 10 and 9. Okay, we got about 20 responses. Let's see a few more. Okay, suddenly the big picture guys are lagging and the details is emerging. So it looks like those who respond fast are the big picture guys and those who are in detail are still reading it. Okay, I've got about 23 responses. Let me get a few more and then we'll switch to the next question. All right, so I think everybody have uh, got the hang. It's www.menti.com and the code is 325157. Okay, so I think the house is a bit divided. So I think I, I, I see it's about 30 people, 16, 14 about. Uh, okay, let's look at the next question. What do you like? Do you like speed or do you like perfection? And I know these are the trade-offs. You can't have everything. Okay, that's lovely. So lots of perfection. All right. Okay. Nobody likes speed, but likes perfection. Okay, one to thirty-four. Okay, lovely. I think we've got a few more and then I switch. So it's perfection. All right. Okay. Okay, the, the next one, the next question is, uh, do you like mathematics or do you like physics? physics okay right all of these questions are actually profiling you so just in case you thought that i'm just doing this just killing time by asking you this uh, stupid question They are actually profiling you in terms of uh, what the
question is uh, do you like mathematics or do you like physics physics okay right All of these questions are actually profiling you. So just in case you thought that. profiling you in terms of uh, what the mindset is. All right, okay, that's good. So about 25, 18. Okay, just to give you, I'll give you a little perspective once I finish these questions. Uh, what is important to you? Uh, how something is done or how to get it done? I know again, trade off, you would say that I want to both, but let's hear. I'm sure some of you watched this program on discovery called how do they do it that's about how it is done and how to get it done is uh, all right okay that's uh, interesting 34 6. okay and uh, thank you so much for playing so well with me last question uh, is the text you got to type it i've got no choices for you what drives you the most what attribute and write in one word or maybe just two i don't need long sentences what what is one thing which drives you the most what makes you wake up from the bed every day and say you know let's get going today today is a special day what are your motivation maybe what drives you the most is, is it money is it knowledge is it experience is it something new is it um, maybe a boyfriend or girlfriend maybe it's something else or whatever okay my aim that's goal okay all right let me just hide the result I don't, you're not going to hear, you're not going to see anybody else's results till I actually show it to you. Okay, so I've got about 10 responses. Okay, we've got 12, some more. We had about 40 responses to the objective type questions. It's when it comes to writing the essays, we have the dropout so 21 that's good okay let's let's see the results All right okay so it's uh, money experience knowledge these are mean bear which means there are more words for that uh, love and affection challenge study respect time dream professor oh professor drives i i didn't ask you that who drives you out i said that you know what drives you so i'm sure the professors drive you out <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, so I got 37 responses. I think that's good. Uh, more keep coming, that, that's really helpful, but I think that that uh, serves my purpose. I got what it is. So one thing I will tell you, some analysis from the responses that you got, and then we'll go into the slides of what I came to present here today, is uh, money drives some of you, which is a good news, because at least you know what you're driving for. And uh, I belong to the capitalist side of the world, and uh, my wife belongs to the socialist side of the world. So. 
I do all these sins and make money and she does all the good work and wipes out all my sins because she works for a foundation and not for profit. So we kind of do our balance sheet together. But I think it's a good idea. There's no harm uh, for money to be driving you, but if money can drive you to do wrong thing, that's a bad idea. So doing, making money legitimately is the best thing to do. And uh, it's important to have some purpose. I think the knowledge and experience coming even better, that's, that's really a good idea. If I were to go back and look at some of these analysis out here, so you know, uh, I'll, I'll come to the is um, this one because you know the classes did divide it. There are some people who like to say, you know, what's the big picture, and I'll get to the details. There are some who start with detail and get out of the big picture. That's like a normal distribution, which looks good. Uh, this is a little bit disappointing to me. Let me just tell you what, because uh, this tells me that uh, you may not be truly uh, wired for the real world. Because uh, many of you would have uh, learned, okay, um, somebody likes to do this thing, I will decline, all right? So you don't write, that's my class, I control it, okay? Um, the world is about being agile. I don't think the world is about being perfect because perfection is the enemy of good. Uh, I'm sure one need to be perfect, but the amount of time it's gonna take you to become perfect, you'll be done. So the world of today is not about getting the perfect answer. The world of today is continuing to do. So progress or perfection is actually far more important virtue than being perfect. Uh, you can actually never be perfect. So I think I would like to work on a little bit about the mindset question saying, you know, don't aim for perfection. I think you should aim for good. The concept of prototyping, the concept of doing something. Now, let me just tell you the world of perfection was yesterday. When we used to build software, we used to build software which used to take 10 years to build and five years to de deploy. Today, when you do a mobile app, it takes about 45 days for a new app to be released. Imagine you downloaded a Facebook app and Facebook said that now we will do the next release, the next version and the next features for you after two years, because that's when we'll reach perfection. I don't think you'll like that. So the world of today is hardly about perfection. I didn't mean about bad quality, but I think I mean about speed is far more important than perfection. Speed at the cost of quality, no, but the speed at the cost of perfection, absolutely yes. So I think I think it's a little bit of a mindset you will, when you get into the corporate life, you've got to look at it here. Uh, I'll talk about the next one. Uh, I gave this thing, I know it's subconscious mind, which picks up some of these things. So uh, people who deal with physics are real world people. People who deal with mathematics are uh, not so real world people. I know there are some mathematics professors out here. I'm not uh, disrespecting, I'm not disappointing to you, but it's about, you know, are you solving gravitational is a real world thing. Algebra is a manifestation of how do you get to that. So I think it's a good divided house. Uh, I like it because, you know, I think it's it's good that I see, but I would have liked to see this from an MBA class rather than from a BTEC class. So the BTEC class, I think I would have liked to see a little bit of how it is done is equally important because you possibly can't uh, get it done unless you know how it is done. So those people, you know, and, and there are some nuances about, you know, can you manage a hospital without being a doctor? Things are changing now, but you know, there's a bit of, I think an interesting perspectives out here. Um, I wanted this response, what your favorite ice cream is. And uh, most people say it's chocolate. A uh, few said butterscotch, vanilla, mango. Nobody likes coffee, mint or strawberry, but that's fine. All right, thank you so much for this. Uh, Nice update. I will now go down to uh, actually share my presentation. So let me just uh, stop sharing this one and I will uh, share something else now. Okay, so, but if you have any questions till that time, um, just make sure that you um, feed it in. Okay, let me just get the right screen. I'll stop sharing first so that it's otherwise it's going to things. So I'll, and now I will share my slides. Uh, just a quick check. Are you able to see my slides in full screen mode? Yes, sir. Oh. Okay, lovely. All right, okay. So I'm going to talk to you about a few things. Let me start with uh, the phrase FOMO. I'm sure most of you are familiar. Uh, FOMO stands for uh, fear of missing out. And this is a fear most humans have. 
because we are designed to say that you know how can i not be in it how can i miss it it's like about the phrase you may have heard of i want to have the cake and eat it too so the fear of missing out is a syndrome or a fear which runs in our mind which basically says that you know how can i be missed out i want to attend that party i want to top the class i want to be the best person making money and i want to also have the best boyfriend and girlfriend so this whole concept of doing everything being everywhere being at all times is actually the enemy of being anywhere because you possibly can kind of know not live in the present so let me start with the basic concept of opportunity cost so there are uh, lots of things which led to uh, you can create a lot of things and you can consume a lot of things there are limitations i'm sure economics has taught us that there are limitations about resources resources are always scarce so you got to prioritize and if there's one resource which is certainly the scarce for everybody or is limited for everybody is time so how do you manage your time is going to be the biggest capability which you can learn five years ago so i have a little bit of uh, i should say the benefit these perspectives which i've learned from my time so clearly one of the big choices which you'll have to make is that what do you do with the certain things so life is all about making choices and unfortunately life does not have certainty of outcomes irrespective and i'm sure some of you may have visited and consulted astrologers in your life there is nobody on earth who can actually tell you how your life will unfold you can potentially make certain choices which could potentially depict certain changes in the trajectory which you go but there is no way you can predict or you can control your life completely but the choices which you make will actually make you either happy or sad about some of those things i give you another example because most of you are from engineering students um the game of chess which is rather simple it's got uh, 8 by 8 64 uh, checkerboard now if i were to ask you that you know how many choices are there when you have to open a chessboard and potentially most of you would know that the number of choices you can open a chessboard with is 20 but once you open the chessboard and you are in the second move how many choices do you have possibly many more by the time you are on the fourth or the fifth move on a chessboard the number of choices turn into billions so you can make billion choices and I must tell you that life is even more complex than the game of chess. Actually, life is like the game of snooker or a billiards or a pool, as some of you may know. Because in the game of chess, you can only make certain rule-based moves. But in the game of life, you can make many, many different moves. So I'm gonna to talk to you about a little bit about you know, what certain choices and moves that you make. And in other words, how do you manage the opportunity cost? the cost of not doing something, the cost of an alternative which you did not take. So some of you may think, I wish I could have gone to a medical college. You can't evaluate that option because you can't go to, you can only make one choice. It's not about a simulation game anymore. It's about the choice which you make and what the outcome does it deliver. So the cost of next best alternative is lost when a choice is missed and you will never get to that. Let me just get into, uh, I'll skip this slide in the interest of time. Let me just come to what some of the perspectives I wanted to share with you here today. And again, these perspectives are based on a corporate life. So some of you may choose to have a different life. Some of you may get an academician. Some of you may like to do a research. Some of you may, I'm not talking about those because I'm none. When I made the choice, I lost those alternatives. So I lost the alternative to be a professor. I lost the alternative to be a researcher. I lost the alternative to be somebody else. I became a, a corporate citizen. And therefore, I'm going to talk to you about the corporate life. So before I go into that thing, I want to give you the one single thing which is called the digital effect. Now, some of you who watch Netflix or others would have heard of this show called The Queen's Gambit. But let me give you a little bit of history. The Queen's Gambit was a book, it's a fiction book, which was launched in 1983. So the author at that point in time, which is Walter Travis, wrote a book, which is a very nice novel about the game of chess, a lady who plays chess very nice, called Queen's Gambit. And that book did okay. I don't think it did uh, great in 1983, the March of 1983. And now I'm gonna take you now. What happened about uh, 37 years later, and now we see Queen's Gambit, the novel has been turned into a Netflix series. And what happens? And these are the data as of October, 2020. October, 2020, Netflix released Queen's Gambit in a video format. So the same book turned into a movie or kind of a web series 
and it's and this two date might be dated because it's, it's, it's a December statistics. By the end of December, almost 62 million households, not 62 million people, 62 million households, because one T is being seen by many people, had watched the show. The inquiries of chessboard went up by 250 cent just on eBay. How to play chess, a search phrase, went up all time high in nine years. And the original novel, the novel which was created 37 years ago by Walter Travis, became a New York Times bestseller. It wasn't a New York Times bestseller then. And the number of players on chess.com, which is actually a site where you can play chess online, which makes revenue by making people play chess, has gone up 5x. So the point I'm trying to make is that the digital effect of our world is unparalleled. So what happened in the physical world may have had one trajectory, but what is happening in the digital world? And I'm telling you, it is impossible for us to fully predict where this will go, but it'll certainly go somewhere which it hasn't gone before. So the impact, the physical world had direct cause and effect, and that's what the causal analysis is the fish plus, but the digital world is nowhere close to what is taught in the physical world because it's very different. We are trying to understand, we haven't understood. So again, coming back to my point is, speed versus perfection. I think the speed is going to see an unparalleled dimension compared to what we have seen before. I hope someday we are able to travel faster than the speed of light and Einstein while we're turning in his grave and some of the professors will hate me when I say it. I hope we will not because the law of physics will limit us. But I think the speed of human actions, the speed of human mind, the speed of human going through the roof and the impact of that is not unidimensional, it is multidimensional. So let me just get into some of the perspectives I have. Many of you would have seen this chart. It's a chart prepared by Dunning Kruger, the two research scientists, and it's something which I love all the time when I think something else. It's called the Dunning Kruger effect. Let me take a minute to explain it. This is a chart which plots on the x axis as the wisdom grows, what is the effect of that wisdom on individuals' confidence? It is a super generalized uh, topic. Uh, is that a question? Right. Are you able to hear me? Okay. All right. Okay. So the Dunning-Kruger effect basically says that as an individual starts to gain knowledge, what happens to their confidence? So this is the point when you know nothing. So at this point in time, you have zero knowledge. And when you have zero knowledge, you have zero confidence. But imagine you sit through the first class of thermodynamics. You say, okay, now I know thermodynamics. I know it really well. You start to understand internal combustion engines, and then you're confident. Uh, can somebody, uh, uh, Kanish, can you go on mute, please? It's just... All right, thank you so much. So, as I think that when you sit through the first class, uh, and I just took the example of thermodynamics, you start to say, oh, I know it all, and your confidence goes up. You sit through the second class, you learn a little bit more, your confidence goes up. And by the time you're in the fifth, sixth, or eighth class of thermodynamics, you say, yeah, I really know it well. I can tell you how the internal combustion engine works. I can tell you a two wall, two cylinder, four wall, four cylinder, all the thing which I learned, which I really don't remember all the time. As we start to learn something new, our confidence starts to get to a really high point, and that's called the peak of Mount Stupid. And why it's called the peak of Mount Stupid? Because actually you don't know a whole lot, but you think you know a whole lot. And this is the syndrome which everybody goes when they go through the learning. Once you get to a point where you say, you know, oh, I know a lot, then you start to realize that you know. Can the moderator mute everybody, please? Pardon, sir? I'm getting a lot of noise uh, from one of the speakers. Can you just mute? Okay, okay, we'll just check, sir. Yeah, all right, thank you so much. I hope, sir, there is no um, noise now. We have muted all the participants. Okay, all right. If you have, because I'm getting a noise, uh, but that but that could be something called like Kanishak Sharma, which continues to uh, be bothering noise. Yeah, all we'll, right. we'll just check, sir. We'll just all check. right, no problem. So, so when you start to learn something, 
you get to the peak, which is called the peak of Mount Stupid. And then once you know more about a subject, then you realize how little do I know about it. So as you start to thereafter learn, which is gone to the point of inflection, after that you start to, the more you learn, the more you realize that how little do you know it. And this is typically called that the peak, the, the, the trough, or then you finally get to what's called the valley of despair. So this is a very strange phenomena. You learn more, your confidence goes up, it gets to a point and you say that, you know, oh, I don't know enough. And your confidence actually goes down every time you learn more. So the more you learn, and this is typically most people get into their PhD students, I'm sure some of the professors here would have realized that the more you discover that you realize that how little do you know about the subject. And then you get to the point of value of despair saying, I'm never going to get it right. And after that, you start to get into a slope of enlightenment and you get to saying, yeah, it's now starting to make a point. And therefore, once you get to the real point, which is a plateau, which is saying people believe that, trust me, it's complicated. So as you start to learn more, your confidence will go up, go down, go up. But keep in mind that if you are learning in the early stages and if you think that you really know it all, try and be conscious that you might be going up the uh, Mount Peak stupid. So this is something which is very important. And I can tell you that I've gone through this. I still think that I'm still sitting, sitting the value of despair. I have not got to the slope of enlightenment, etc. I think some people have uh, Shakespeare has talked about it. Buddha has talked about it. But this is a real common phenomena in our human life. So as a student, I would like you to keep it in the back of your mind all the time that the more you learn, the confidence will grow, but then you will realize that how little do you know? So the, sub, the world is very complex, very complicated. There are lots and lots of things which you can learn. So don't build a false confidence that you know it all because that may not be the reality of your world. I'll take you through another experiment. This is an experiment conducted a few hundred years ago. And uh, somebody was asked to say that, you know, can you go and measure how long is the coastline of England? So if you were to go and so this is the this is the picture of England, the old England. If you were to measure how long is this coastline, and again maybe they didn't have the best engineers at that point in time as uh, today the university is producing, and they said, okay, if my yardstick, and that's where the yardstick comes from, if my yardstick is 200 kilometers, which means my unit of measure or least count, as they teach you in in, in engineering colleges, if my least count is 200 kilometer, which means that I can't measure anything less than 200 kilometer. And if you were to use a 200 kilometer yardstick, the coastline of Britain comes to about 2,400 kilometers. Is that the right number? Possibly not. What if I actually reduced the size of my yardstick, which means that I reduce the least count of my measurement. And if I start to, instead of using a 100 kilometer yardstick, I use, uh, instead of 200, I use a 100 kilometer yardstick and the length of the same island, the same British island becomes 2,800 kilometers. And if I reduced it even further, when I measure it with a 50 kilometer yardstick, the length comes to about 3,400 kilometers. Now, what is the real length of coastal England? It's very hard to measure. In fact, it's impossible to measure in some of these. Professors will tell you that you could get different answers depending upon the lens you're applying. If you apply a details lens, you'll get a very different answer. If you apply a big picture lens, you'll get a very different answer. I asked you a question saying, are you a picture guy or a detail guy? Keep in mind that both of you are right, but both of you will get to different answers. So when you look at things in detail, you get very different answers. When you look at a big picture, so the big picture might give you speed, this one might give you perfection and accuracy. These are the trade-offs which you'll have to always deal with. So what it matters in life is not being either a detail side or on perfection side. What matters in life is to know when do you need to be a big picture and when do you need to be detailed. When speed matters and when perfection matters. Because if you start to fixate your mindset saying that I will always go for details or I'll always go for big picture, chances are that you will disappoint yourself because life is very complicated. In fact, uh, there's a, there's a, a Gregor Mendelet which talks about that it's almost impossible to measure the coastline of any island given the fractals and some of those things. That's for another class when we talk about it, but that's the point. If you didn't believe, if you look at the stock market charts or when you look at sea waves, when you're sitting next to the sea waves, you find them very rough sea waves, but go up four meters and then you start to see it's very calm. So the details and big picture. So do you want to see the waves or do you want to see the sea? 
it's very different perspective, but you should know in what situation, what lens do you apply. Now, if you don't believe me, I'll just give you give another simple test. This is uh, a world map. I'm sure you don't see it these days uh, very often because you did it in your geography classes many years ago, or you now see it on the GPS or Google Maps or some of those applications which you use on your phone. Now, this is the world map. I've not uh, tempered this world map at all. I've used this world map as it was. I was taught with this world map many, many years ago, and my daughter is being taught through this world map now. I've not made any changes, any tempering. Now, if I were to ask you, and I haven't put a Mentimeter to this, so you can use your chat window to write to me, is how big do you think Africa is compared to Greenland? And I'm sure you know this is Africa, and this is Greenland. Tell me, how big is it? Is Africa and Greenland same size? Is Africa 1.5 times bigger? Or is Africa two times bigger? So I'm getting something 1.5 twice. Uh, Anand says 1.5. Some more people. What is? What do you think is the right answer? Uh, of course, you can Google, but that's not the intention I'm doing it. Just tell me, look at this map. This is the map which you've all been taught. And all our professors, at least my geography professor, taught me with this world map. OK, I'm getting some more answers. And here is what you would see, 1.5, 2, OK, 1.5. All right, let me just tell you that if I were to put, let, let me bring them together and how it look like. So this is how they look like. Does anybody want to change their answers now? I've just picked up Greenland and put it closer to Africa in the same lens. But the reality is if I actually looked at Greenland and fit it into Africa, this is where it will fit in. And the reality is if you were to do Google, you will figure out that Africa is 14 times bigger than Greenland. Now what's going on here? I really want you to reflect and think about it. What's going on here? Why are all our professors cheating on us? Why is our education system so flawed all over the world, not just in India, not just in Rajasthan Technical University or somewhere? Why am I being fooled? Who's taking me for a ride? Why did somebody not tell me the real truth? That Greenland isn't that big. When I've actually been, so Radesham Seni ji have a calculation that it's 14x bigger. That's right. So this is area of 2.166 versus 30.37 kilometer, million kilometers. Think about it. What's going wrong with our education system? Why am I teaching people? And when I look at my, my daughter's map book, which is what she has it here, I feel sad because we are being taught here. But let me tell you that it's not their complete fault. Of course, they are at fault. Of course, the education system got to change a little bit here and there. The real issue is that we are trying to depict a three-dimensional world on a two-dimensional paper. Now, I'm sure many of you are experts here. You do, uh, you, you use the drafting and uh, you know, contouring way better than I ever did in my, my engineering classes. But the problem is that when you try to solve a three-dimensional problem and manifest it into a two-dimensional world, you will make distortions. And this is the result of a distortion. But the problem is that while everybody is making those distortions, nobody is writing a disclaimer beyond that world map saying that, you know, this distortion has been made. And honestly, the distortion has been made by just if you're interested in detail, because it's called the Cartesian projection. It's a projection by which you look at the world from top and then flatten it to the bottom. And as a result, anything which is in the northern hemisphere, the likes of Greenland, the light of Canada and Russia, they become bigger. And anything which is on the southern hemisphere, which is unfortunately Australia, unfortunately Africa, unfortunately South America, they start to look smaller than they actually are. Now, who decided? Who decided to say that we should look at the world from the top? Why don't we look at the world from bottom? Because somebody said that the north is pointing upwards. But I don't think that when the Big Bang happened, they actually said that the world has to be looked north, up, down. So we make assumptions, we make approximation, we make distortions. So again, the point I'm trying to tell you that you know what you are studying today is not perfect, and is not designed to be perfect. It'll have a different application, a different manifestation, and the world is becoming so complex. So I could have still lived with the same studies, the same pattern, the same skill set if I was living in March of 1983 when Queen's Gambit was only sold on bookshelves. But today, Queen's Gambit is not being sold on bookshelves. Of course, being sold on Amazon, Kindle, and all the formats, but being turned into a video series. And now, therefore, it's got the impact on chess.com and on the eBay and all of that. So the point I'm trying to say is that keep your mindset much more broader. 
do not get fixated. Don't think that what you see is what you get. It's not. What you see is what you don't get. You got to test. And again, I go back to saying that if you got a 200 kilometer uh, yardstick, you'll get Britain as 2,400 kilometers. If you got a 50 kilometer yardstick, you'll get a 3,400. The gap is not, the Britain hasn't changed. It's about your mindset. It's about your perspective. How do you see things? And that's really important. Let's get into a little bit of details of what's the real difference between having good skill set and having a growth mindset. They're two different things, all right? Before I take you there, I want to say sorry to you. And I want to say sorry because uh, you may not be built to succeed. It is unfortunately, and it's nothing to do with the university which you're studying in, it's nothing to do with the education system which you're part of. It is unfortunately the makeup of this entire society and the education system which we get through is that we may not be built to succeed, especially when I talk about the corporate world. I'm sure you may be built to succeed in many other world, but in the corporate world, the mindset required is very different compared to what the mindset creation which may happen through our early growing years. The, the, the day you walked into your nursery grade, the day you walked into your primary school, the day you walked into your uh, secondary and those cases, there's a lot of things which are being worked on our mindset, which may be twisting, which may be turning what we have. So let me start with that uh, apologies before I get into what I mean. So the first thing is, Everything in life, and I told you again, I asked you those six questions, speed versus perfection, details versus big picture. Everything is about trade-off. Now, before I talk about the trade-off you're gonna to make today, let me tell you the trade-offs our ancestors made. And when I'm talking about our ancestors, I'm not talking about your, your, your mother or your father or your grandmother or grandfather or great-grandfather. I'm talking about several stages great-grandfathers. And typically it's assumed that the chimpanzees were the early human, so I'm going to give you a little bit difference between the chimpanzees and humans. So what humans did, humans actually did a great trade-off that we wanted to have superior language capability. And when we had to build language, what we had to lose is memory. Now this is of course scientific research. I definitely don't, I'm not the expert on it. I've read about it, but this I'm going to tell you. So chimpanzees were great at remembering things they could learn, they could memorize, whatever they could. But we could have remained chimpanzees if we only focused on having great memory. And we said, okay, no, I want to have a great language. I want to communicate, I want to talk. And as a result, that space of the mind got developed to have superior language capability, but we lost a part of our memory capability. Don't believe me, I'll give you some hi highlights. Of course, uh, reminded me of uh, Nida Fazli, a great uh, poet, who said that Tabi kisi ko mukammal jaha nahi milta. no one ever gets the universe. So let me tell you that if our great grandfathers like chimpanzees made the choice, the choices you will have to make will be very important. So you cannot, not, I, you will have to miss out certain things to make something better. You can't do everything. Nobody can get everything and nobody can be perfect. And therefore you got to choose what kind of mindset that you build. As you start to develop, to reduce the noise into the system, you get into typically the high efficiency or high robustness areas. Uh, moderator, can you please mute everybody? Okay, I'll, I'll go quick fast in the interest of time. So, so basically, when we moved away from being chimpanzees, we made certain trade off. We built some capability which are much stronger and lost some of the capability. If you don't believe me, uh, watch this interesting game uh, and you want to watch, there's a, there's a YouTube video on this one called Minefield. And in that, they will tell you that chimpanzees can actually beat humans in the game of memory. So if you were to play a game of memory with chimpanzees, you will lose for sure, because they have the ability to memorize a lot more than what we have. But what they don't have, they don't have the ability of the language, which we as humans have developed. So if chimpanzees had to do trade-off, you'll have to do trade-off of what you want to do in your own life. So the first one I want to talk about is 
are you an individual excellence guy or are you a collective success guy? Yes. And unfortunately, the education system, the education system, and I'm not talking about this here, but the entire education system actually forces us to be more around individual excellence. start to become more uh, collegiate. Some of them start to do group uh, subjects and some of them start to do some assignments. But let me tell you that the education system by far is focused on individual excellence. And I'm not suggesting we change that, not at all. But all I'm suggesting that you should know that you are being trained to be individually excellent. But in the corporate world, if there's one thing which is hated the most is individual brilliance. What you need is collective success because you can't have you're working in a company of 2000 people and five of them are outstanding and the remaining are not that can happen only in a classroom in the world of corporate everybody is either a hero or nobody is a hero so this is going to be a big shift you will have to make and therefore i always encourage that if you are an individual excellence guy you will have a tougher time typically and uh, unfortunately i did very well in my uh, schools uh, I realized that was a big limitation. So being a topper of the class is a bad idea. I'm not suggesting that you don't be the topper of the class, but I think being only obsessed, being that I am the best and nobody else, or being better at the expense of somebody else is a bad idea when it comes to corporate world. So individual success is important. You got to learn individually at some point, but collectively and building together. So if you haven't started to do build teamwork, if you don't already play, play a sport, a sport will make you a better team player. Uh, I have this regret. I never played a team sport, and that's something which comes to hurt you. So either get to a team sport or start to become a team learner. When you learn together, you're likely to get better mindset. If you, this is a quote which I borrowed from Albert Einstein. He says that you know I have no special talent. Of course, he's lying. He did. I'm only passionately curious, and I'm going to pick up these two words, which is passionate and curious. Both of them. Can you please? Uh, this is a bit of noise. I, I I think I'm getting distracted. Uh, the speaker says, Radhesh Ram Seni. It says Radhesh Ram Seni. Okay, sir. We'll just check. Radhesh. Okay. Yes, sir, okay. we have checked. Lovely. Good. Thank you so much. Yeah, so I'm going to pick on these two words, which is passionate and curious. Uh, let me tell you one of the interesting um, interviews I watched, that of uh, Jeff Bezos. Some of you who order from Amazon would know Jeff Bezos is nobody who created Amazon. And what for Jeff important? He says that most of us are gifted with something. Somebody might be gifted to be a great musician. Somebody might be gifted to be good at mathematics. Somebody might be gifted to be a good artist. But if we continue to just keep our gift, we are actually doing disservice to you. How do you take your gift and make it your passion is a differentiation. So if you're good at mathematics, don't leave it there. Take it to the level of depth you can get to. If you are a good artist, become the best sketch artist, become the best painter. Become, And I'm not saying that this because these are the right things to say. Of course, I'm not suggesting that people who are an engineering graduate will start to become fashion models. That's what I'm suggesting. But are you really, really, really the expert in one thing where you can be beaten by nobody? Because in the real life, in the corporate world, especially in the consulting world, we need what is called the T-shaped people. A T-shaped person is very little depth in every subject, but very deep depth in one subject. So you like a T. You are very wide, inch deep, but you are very deep, a mile deep in one subject area. So how do you become a T? Which means that you are you know everything a little bit, but you know one thing really well is when you pursue your passion. So if you have a passion on any of the subjects, it could be about you know maybe chemistry. It could be about you know you could become a material sciences expert. It could be about human resources. You could become an HR expert, but be expert and 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 live your passion. I'm going to run fast in the interest of time. 
I do want to talk about uh, this is a real person. Okay, you know, I, I went to an engineering college like yours, and I had uh, our professor Mathur. Um, okay, somebody says you're disturbing the session. Is it for me? Okay, all right. So uh, this is a real story. Um, this is many years ago, almost two decades ago. We had a professor Mathur, and professor Mathur believed in one thing. He said that, you know, I can really create the great thing out of you. By the way, Professor Mathur also did tuition, which I didn't like, which I never attended. So the mantra Professor Mathur had is saying, you know, to ace in the exam. Yes, Meenal. Okay. All right. So the mantra Professor Mathur had is so that, you know, when you got a question paper, you got certain choices to make. Like I'm talking today that you got certain choices to make. So instead of attempting to do all the questions, can you attempt few questions? So if there are 15 chapters in the book, just focus on 11 of those, because anyway, you got to do five out of seven questions. There are some questions, even if you don't attempt, you're good. And the past year pattern for several years suggest that if you studied from chapter number one to 11 and ignored from 12 to 15 or 12 to 16, you're still good. You'll possibly get more marks by studying less than you'll get by studying everything. Because if you study everything, you've got to make choices. And then you say, okay, you know, I know these five questions better, but I know the sixth one also. Because the examination pattern is saying that you got to pick five out of those seven. And Professor Mathur taught us how to ace the exam. And I think many of us ace the exam. But as a result, what many of us did, we actually never looked at one third of the book. Because that one third of the book was not meant to pass the exam. And actually many of us did line colors because we just focused on five out of seven. Now that could be okay for an engineering student because I studied uh, a different kind of engineering and, and fortunately I'm not building bridges or buildings and I'm not doing any of it. So I can't be responsible for killing innocent people because I'm not applying my engineering uh, building skills here, but I'm applying my engineering fundamental skills here. I learned first principles. I learned the basic problem solving using engineering. But if I were taught that way, I think I will fail. Imagine you have a serious illness and you go to the doctor and the doctor happens to be a trained medical professional. And the only thing you realize that, you know, that doctor in order to pass exams only studied five out of seven. Would you like to be treated by a doctor who only got 45% marks because that was good enough to pass? So it is very important for us to understand that, you know, the, the, if I'm sure all of you are focused on getting good grades because that's how you get good placements. But don't read selectively, because if you read selectively, you don't even know what you're missing. So I luckily had Professor Mathur. I hope you don't, but that's an important story I want to you. One thing which I will tell you that talent is overrated. A lot of you believe that, you know, X person is smarter. Y is not. I'm good. You're not. I'm so bad. This person. Enough amount of research has taught us that. Talent is overrated. You will find a lot of people who Who studied something and didn't get anywhere and a lot of people who didn't study anything but got hurt. so the guy and the, i'll talk about some of my friendlier examples so the guy who built one of the largest city bank operations in india actually was a second division guy and he's a good friend of mine and he said that you know the only thing he was good at was football because he was so good at football he could get people together i'm not suggesting that you aim for second grade okay you should aim for first grade and many other things and all that but don't get that you know this particular talent is overrated because talent is 
and especially when it comes to some of these engineering talents or medical or uh, management talent we are learning they will change honestly i went to engineering college 25 years ago and half of those things are not relevant anymore so we should start to build things do you have the ability to learn because the world will change so what i learned i i went to learn again it talk about a little bit i learned fortran 77 in my college the fortran 77 is no longer relevant today so my expertise on that is useless at best. so you have to look at it. there is enough experiment and studies which have been done so that you know hard work grit commitment will surpass strong talent so somebody who is super hard working let's say somebody is talented i'm telling you in the long run hard work will win over talent because the world of today is changing faster so somebody who is talented for today's world is no longer going to be talented for the next word. I'm not suggesting that you don't focus on your studies, but I'm suggesting that you focus on hard work. You focus on your attitude. That will get you much faster. There are many examples. Some of you may have picked up, Airtel is hiring the new CIO today. In fact, uh, they, they just announced in the press two days ago. Now, if you look at, go and look at the LinkedIn profile of that person. That person is not even a B-Tech undergrad. That person is Bachelor of Arts. And that person has great capabilities compared to many people who went to an engineering college. And that person is going to head entire Airtel's global product engineering, technology engineering capability. So I don't buy that, you know, what you learn, what you gain today is going to lead you. But this person, if you look at file, he has been a continuous learner. So after he finished his school, he went to work for a company where he learned a completely new skill from there on, if you look at his learning track record, he's acquired one skill or another every couple of years, and that gets you. So learning just once is no longer enough. I'm gonna go fast now in the interest of time. A Lot of people know a lot, but in corporate world, it's not about who knows the most, it's about who articulates the best. I know sometimes our engineering colleges don't spend too much time and they shouldn't spend too much time, but in your separate time, in your, uh, free time. If there's one skill which I would like you to acquire, and I'm moving away from mindset now to a little bit of skill set, is the power of storytelling. Now, storytelling used to be a negative word many years ago, but it's now the right thing. So the ability to communicate, the ability to communicate your point of view is very important. I struggled with this limitation for many years. I wasn't a good communicator. And I realized that, you know, how hard can it be when you know it all, but you can't communicate the best. So try and learn, and it's 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 one of the easiest signs to learn. How do you communicate? There are many books which have been written on it. There's some, some of my favorite books like Barbara Minto and some of the other ones which talk about the pyramid principle, but communication is a very powerful language. If you can't communicate, you even if you know everything, it is useless. So in the corporate world, those who know the most don't succeed, but those who can communicate, articulate point of view, that is one of the better skills. So take a side course. There are enough courses available these days on Coursera and some of these other platforms like you did. Me. My strong suggestion would be that learn to communicate because that is far more important than just the knowledge. Interesting perspective. What's called the Aristotle way or the Sherlock ways. So the Aristotle way is that you start with the theory, build that theory into a hypothesis, build that into an observation, and you either confirm, which means prove the hypothesis or disprove the hypothesis. This is what is a deduction kind of thing. And then of course, there's an induction theory, which is you start with an observation, look at a pattern, build a hypothesis, and that's your theory. Both are right. Both are effective in different circumstances. One is called analysis, the other is called synthesis. Analysis is breaking things down. Synthesis is bringing things together. I don't talk much about it, but there's an interesting book on this, which is the design thinking. There are many other, other authors which we kind of talk about it. Acquire that book and start to read a little bit about it because this book helps you not in building a skill set, but building a mindset. Are you an inductive person or are you a deductive person? There are two different ways. There are different ways you'll solve a problem using analytical tools. There are different ways you'll solve a problem using synthesis tools. Both of them are important, but I wanted to give you the perspective that you got to choose which one works in which situation. Another thing which I want to talk to you about is uh, from mindset perspective, that once you leave your studies and start to work either on your own, these days many of you start on your own, you become entrepreneurs, or you start to work for a corporate, 
you will no longer just be you because you're not talking about what you are, but you will be talking about what a brand you are. So today I'm here, I'm talking about not as me, but I think I represent also the brand which I'm part of, the company which I work for. I'll give you one very interesting experiment and you may find it interesting to hear the results of that experiment. In that experiment, uh, there are a group of people who go to a restaurant and when they go to a restaurant, they are greeted by a very rude waiter. Okay, so this restaurant is like a setup. It's it's an experiment and the person who is serving you is very rude. She or he doesn't take your order properly. She misses certain things and all of that. And then at the end, when the uh, check comes or the, the bill which you get of what you've eaten, the restaurant as part of the experiment knowingly charges you less. Okay, so the experiment is that you walk into a restaurant which is set up and you have a rude waiter and she doesn't treat you properly. But when she brings a bill, instead of this being 2000 rupees, she charges you 1500 rupees. What are the chances that you will actually tell that waiter saying, you know, you made a mistake. You should have been charging us for 2000, but you charge us for 1500. In the same experiment, another restaurant where uh, you're greeted by one of the best service person in the world. So she treats you very well. She takes her order. She's asking you how you like the food, etc., etc. And then she makes the same mistake that instead of charging 2000, she, she presents a bill of 1500 to you. Now imagine you're the same person. You go to restaurant one one day and go to restaurant two the other day. What are the chances that you will tell restaurant one, a rude waiter saying that they have undercharged you or the second person was, you know, the nice waiter and she's undercharged. More often than not, people don't tell the rude waiter and they actually pay less and say she deserved it and they walk out. Whereas in the second experiment, which is where you got a nice waiter and you actually tell saying, oh, you made a mistake. You should be charging 2000 rupees. Now in both these situations, you should know that the waiter doesn't own the restaurant. The restaurant is owned by somebody else. The waiter is just simply an agent of that brand. Now the behavior of that agent actually has an impact on the brand. So in the first experiment, the hotel will lose money and possibly will be out of business if they have bad waiters. And the other one, the hotel will possibly make more money and the restaurant will thrive because they have good waiters. I'm not suggesting that either of us are waiters here, but all of us are agents in big businesses. So we are part of a big entrepreneur, big. In fact, today you represent the institution which you're part of. So it's very important that our mindset, and here I gave you this example of a waiter serving rudely or serving nicely, is just an example of mindset. If you have the mindset to grow, you will grow. If you have mindset to be fixed, you will not grow. So it's important that you no longer, right now you are who you are. So if you do well in studies, you get great marks. If you get do poorly in studies, you get poor marks. But once you're out of it, you're no longer you. You are representing a big brand, a big company, your own company, your own institute. So for that institute, you got to change your mindset compared to, because the consequences are not on you, the consequences are on somebody else. What does the future look like? I'm going to try and attempt. This is nothing which you know we all know for sure. But this is the kind of trends which you're seeing. And I did not pick up a global chart. I picked up an India chart, which is a little bit old chart here, which talks about saying, you know, starting since 1983, what are the kind of jobs which are actually declining and what are the kind of jobs which are going up? So clearly, as you can see that the routine, manual and uh, non-routine uh, kind of jobs, which are manual, are all declining. But what is going up is analytical jobs, the cognitive jobs, and what is going to be even called out as routine cognitive. But cognitive is very important. So cognitive, as you can say, is a, is a, is a cerebral or the, the mind game. If all the jobs in tomorrow's world are not about fixing uh, an electrical connection, the jobs tomorrow are not just building mindlessly, if it's all about cognitive, because machines will take over to do many other things which we as a human do today, it is very important for you to have skill set, but not stop there. In this session today, I'm not talking about saying that you trade mindset for skill set. You have the skill set, but build on mindset. And I gave you the example that you'll have to do certain trade offs, so you'll have to give up certain skills to acquire some of these mindset capabilities. This is my favorite chart, which again says that
which you know sometimes you can be too busy many people come and tell me saying you know i've got no time because i'm super busy and that's why you can see that you know you can't adapt the world of digital technology which you see through this chart is growing much faster than our ability as a human institutions adapt slowest companies adopt even faster and individuals adopt fastest but despite the best adaptable capability of the individual the digital technology is growing the fastest so you creating this technology debt you are not going to be able to catch up with it as much as the institution likes to teach you the best they will not be able to teach you the best because the world is changing much faster so it's your ability how do you align and again you can't learn everything i told you that you got to make certain choices so the technological debt will continue to increase it's up to you as to how fast and how quickly you can adapt so i want to leave you with this simple slide at the end which basically